for their suffering. And now he's going to provide to the disciples an answer as to why they could not cast out the demon. Right here he says, beginning in verse 20, he replied, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus identifies the problem with their practice as a faith problem. He says, you have so little faith. So they have some faith, but then we learn in the next verse that they must have had some faith smaller than a mustard seed. And we get this beautiful analogy between something very small and seemingly meaningless, unless it gets stuck in your tooth. And then a huge mountain. And what Jesus seems to be commenting on here to these disciples is that it wasn't the quantity of your faith that was an issue. It was the quality of your faith. It, it's suggested here that they were operating in some power other than what he had delegated them. Because if they were operating in his power, that man, fully man and fully God, who we just saw earlier in the chapter transfigured on the mountain, if they had just a mustard seed's worth of faith, they would have been successful. And what we learn here is that the object of our faith matters. Faith doesn't get the job done. It's faith in Christ that gets the job done. And, and then just a quick note here on this last verse. Nothing will be impossible for you. I think it's important to mention there. This verse and others in the Bible are often used to suggest that if you can muster up the proper amount of faith, you can have anything you want, anything you desire. That may be known as name it and claim it. Craig has given you all excellent dissertations on the problems with all of that over the years. But that's not what this verse is about. This verse, and in its context, is rooted in the power and the will of Jesus Christ. You can... Ask and see if it's in Jesus' will, that's fine. But when he's speaking here, he's saying nothing is impossible. And the corollary to that is with Jesus Christ and in God's will. So our second principle for the night is followers of Jesus respond to his glory by making him the object of their faith. So we, we see... Jesus' glory in this chapter and his ability to heal, right? And we see it in his patience in some regards with the disciples, even though they're frustrating him highly. If glory is the sum of all his attributes, those are the two that are on display here. And we also want to note and make sure we understand that when Jesus is walking around in flesh, his glory is veiled, but it's not faded glory, right? He's not diminished in any way. He's chosen to walk in that way so that he can redeem us, and he still is powerful and full of glory. What practical need has Jesus met in your life? How does that encourage you to center your faith on him? Said another way, if, if having enough, having quality faith is what doubts about Jesus do you need to deal with in your life? Do you think some of the sin you've committed is unredeemable if you confess and repent of it? I'd suggest that, that you're wrong. Do you think it's impossible for a friend or a family member or a coworker to come to Christ who hasn't? You're wrong. I, that, I think that's him we sang earlier today. He says it great. And even the deepest, darkest infidel has an opportunity to come to know Christ and be saved. Jesus is capable of all these things precisely because we are not. So we can trust in him in making the object of our faith. In Division 3, we get some examples and pictures of Jesus operating in that attribute of his, of humility. Perfect power, but still displaying perfect 
humility. And I'm going to take these in reverse order because I, I think verse 22 is just uh, it's too important not just to leave it to the right there at the end. After they had come back to Capernaum, we're told here in verse 24, Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum. The collectors of the two drachma temple tasks came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? The temple tax was something that was collected by the Jewish community, specifically those who were in charge of the upkeep of the temple. This wasn't a Roman tax. It was something that was unique to their culture. And it was used in advance of the, the temple. Um, men of adult age, up until retirement age probably, were, um, were required to pay this tax, which was about half a day's wages, I think. Two drachmas, about half a shekel. And these teachers have come and asked Peter, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? And Peter says, yes, he does. And then he goes to the house where they're staying And it says here that Jesus was first to speak. What do you think, Simon? He asked. From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? And so that that, that tells us what we need to know. that Jesus knows exactly what's been going on with Peter and these temple officials. He didn't need to be told. And that's because he's the God of that temple. It's, it's ironic that these men have come now to ask him for money to help keep his own house. And it's ironic that Peter committed it to him without asking. But, um, and so what does Peter say? The, the king collects taxes from others. And Jesus confirms the children are exempt. Jesus said to him, but so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take out the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you'll find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and for yours. It's interesting that Jesus says so that we may not cause offense, because I think if we remember just a couple of chapters ago, he wasn't too concerned with the offense of the Pharisees when the disciples tried to tell him, hey, these guys are getting offended. But I think we have to realize that Jesus knew that that group of men had no intention at that time of listening and understanding who Jesus was and what he was there to do. In this instance, Jesus is taking a concern for what his purpose was and what his message was to everyone. He was asking not to take offense because he wanted to make sure he was on task and didn't want mission drift, right? He didn't want people taking offense and detracting from what they were there to do. There's an application for us as followers of Christ. It's a subject that Paul will address in Romans 13 when it comes to Roman taxes as well. How often do we choose to fight battles or stand on our personal privileges in a way that detracts from what our ultimate purpose is? is to share Jesus Christ with others. I, uh, this has become kind of a hot topic. I, I remember a story that someone told me, a good friend of mine, he goes to a church not in town, and he was speaking with somebody at a fellowship night. And this gentleman was talking about how one Sunday he had gone to lunch after church at a buffet establishment. And this was a year and a half ago. And when he walked in, he was not going to wear a mask because he just... And look, I'm not going to comment on on these things other than to say that this gentleman's position was he wasn't going to wear a mask. Well, there was a sign outside that said you got to wear a mask. and So the the little young lady came over and said, sir, I think we're going to need you to put a mask on. And he proceeded to regale her with everything he knew about why masks were useless and he wasn't going to do it. It was a matter of personal right. He was going to give it to her. Of course... What does this $4.50 an hour waitress care about whether or not he has his personal privileges? She's been told by her manager to ask him to put the mask on. It's a policy. So the manager comes over and does the same thing and says, you know, you you need to put a mask on because it's corporate policy. It's not me. i got to ask you to do it. And he proceeded to give him the 
the message about masks and how he was going to stand on his personal freedom or whatever his interpretation of the Bill of Rights were. And eventually, I think they just gave up, according to the story my friend told me, and they just let him go on his way, and he, and he sat down and had his dinner. And my friend said, you know, I didn't really argue with him too much, except that it did burn me up a little bit because I've eaten with this gentleman many times before, and I knew when he sat down at the table that he made it a point to have everybody bow their head and pray in Jesus' name in case anybody asked him about it. He could share Jesus Christ with them. And, and, and my friend said I was burned up because he said, I just wondered what damage would have been done to his witness or if that little waitress or that manager would want to listen to him regale them with stories about a Savior after he had just spent copious amounts of time berating them for their corporate policy over masks. And, and I'm not making a comment other than to say that sometimes a personal sacrifice or taking a break on personal privileges is needed to preserve a witness for Jesus Christ. Jesus did it with regard to the temple taxes. Sometimes we can do that as well. Sometimes there are things to fight for, and sometimes there are other battles to fight from an eternal perspective. And there's no greater expression of a sacrifice in advance of a clear purpose than Christ's suffering before and to the cross. And that's what he explains to his disciples here for a second time in verse 22. When, they came to get, uh, when he came together in Galilee, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. And once again, they didn't understand. They were filled with grief. But these two vignettes here, the fact that we know Jesus did go to the cross and die, and the fact that he did take concern for what people thought of him and his message when it came to eternal matters, shows us this third principle, that followers of Jesus place his purpose and his glory before their personal privilege. Glory is sometimes preceded by suffering. Uh, this, this idea that Jesus was going to die was difficult for the disciples to comprehend and accept. They were going to get a very quick wake-up call on what that felt like. Jesus placed his purpose in redeeming us ahead of his rights and privileges. I mean, just by the very fact of coming down and taking on a man suit, right? And walking around, much less giving up his life. No one took it from him. He gave it up for us. He did this in practical everyday life with the guard of the temple, and he did it with respect to eternity, to the sacrifice of his life, and then being raised from the dead. Because his perspective of eternity was properly focused on his desire to redeem his creation. And, and yet I sometimes find myself debating the need to experience some discomfort or minor inconveniences in advance of this very same purpose. This week, an open-ended question that I think me and my wife are going to address, and I think it's a good one, is we might ask God and ourselves, how can we join him in that, right? In his eternal purpose to redeem others. In our study of Matthew 17, we saw that Jesus' glory is revealed by his presence, by his word, and his power, veiled or unveiled. And we can and should respond to that with hope and faith centered squarely on him. Now, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, in this moment we just acknowledge your glory. We just let ourselves be undone and in awe of your vastness, of your eternal glory. And we ask that we do this regularly, Father, so that we may have a clear idea of who you are, who we are, and what you've done for us. Help us to leave here prepared to carry out your will and your purpose, which is not impossible when we rely and center our faith on you. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen.